Welcome, welcome back. Okay. So, as I said before we started um, break, is that our next section um, is we're going to get to hear from Jen, um, who has some lots of experience to share with us. And I'm going to let her actually introduce herself. And so what we have going on is um, Jen's going to just do kind of a brief introduction. Um, and then I have some questions that um, that that we've you know pre-written here. Um, and we're really talking about the financial realities um, of farming. Um, and so I've got some questions that I'm happy to ask Jen. Um, but if you all have some questions, um, we'd love to take those as well. And so if you could use the chat function um, to ask those questions whenever you think of them, um, we will try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, and again, the focus for tonight is really about um, the financial side of farming. Um, we do have some more panel members, um, some farmer panel members that you hear from next week. Um, but for tonight, we're really talking about the finance piece um, or not finance, that's not, but the financial piece, right? Not, it could be finances as well, I suppose, um, but the financial piece. Um, and so I'm just gonna turn it over to Jen and ask her to introduce herself um, with a little more detail than we had before. Um, and then we'll roll into the questions that I have. And again, if you have questions, um, please put them in the chat box. So you're up, Jen. Right. Well, thanks, Anita. All right, hello guys. I've been able to meet a few of you already. Um, I am Jen Skoog. I am. My farm is just outside of Christine, North Dakota. I am the owner of Family Roots Farm. And um, just to kind of give you a little bit of background, I have been married um, to my husband, Ryan, for 17 years. He is a conventional farmer. He grew up on a conventional farm his entire life. And about um, four or five years ago, we took over his parents' uh, family farm. So he does the field farming. He does the conventional side of things. Um, I'm actually an accountant by trade. Uh, who would have ever thought, right? A farmer and an accountant. Um, and back in 2017, I, 16, 17, um, I actually took the Farm Beginnings course um, through farms. And so because of that, um, everything that I got out of Farm Beginnings and I was all gung-ho, um, in the spring of 2018, I made a huge leap and quit my big fancy corporate job um, and quit my job and started farming full time. So thankfully our family was put into a good position where we were able to actually do that, um, cut a few things out of the budget and, and we can make it work. So once I quit my job, I created Family Roots Farm. And honestly, I've been, I've been building and working on my farm dreams ever since. Um, I don't think, uh, you, you never quit building your dreams. You never quit working on your dreams. Your, your dreams are not the destination, it's the journey. Um, so my operation um, that I have, like I said, my husband does the conventional farming. I help him during harvest, um, but my farm, I've got just under four acres available for vegetables. Um, it would just went up about two acres uh, this upcoming year. So I'm excited for that. I also um, raise a bunch of animals on my farm. Um, I've got uh, laying chickens and I've also got meat chickens that I raise. I've got laying ducks. I've got some guineas to help kill snakes because um, I hate them. I've also raised sheep. Uh, we've got some breeding sheep for the first time this year. So I've got some ewes right now and a ram out there. Um, and so otherwise I also raise lambs um, and currently raise those up for meat animals. Um, and then I also do pigs. So I raise pork and then I also have honeybees. And something I'd like to do this upcoming year is to actually diversify a little bit in my sheep and get some dual purpose animals. So I can also use them for fiber and possibly look at some dual purpose goats. So that is me in a nutshell. <laughs> um, so I hope that helps drum up a few different questions from you guys, um, but let's have at it. Hey, thanks, Jen. <laughs> so my first question is, is what have been the financial realities you've experienced in becoming a farmer? Um, farmers are not typically rich people. <laughs> it is a labor of love. Um, it, it's a it's a huge slap in the face, a little bit of a reality. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm a fairly blunt person. Um, typical farmers, especially when you're first starting out, 
you don't don't expect to make a ton of money. Um, you know, I've been doing family writs now for a few years and starting to finally make some traction now this year. Um, you know, along with those lines, uh, the financial aspect is everybody's going to be starting in a different spot. You know, some people have a nice little nest egg and they're like, yeah, I got, you know, 50 grand. Let's go blow it on, you know, some farm or some. And some people are looking at it going, oh my gosh, I literally have the seeds, the seeds in this box and I've got this little plot in my backyard and that's it. So um, the good news is it doesn't matter if you've got this little plot in your backyard or you've got a huge farm, you can make it happen. You know, there, there are ways um, to financially make it work. You don't have to have a ginormous operation to make money. Um, you don't have to have a generous operation to be financially successful. Thank you. So how did you go about building a budget for your farm dream? I'm glad you asked that. So the last couple of years, um, I have also been teaching some things in the farm beginnings class. And one of the things that we go over are enterprise budgets. Um, and uh, whole farm budgets. So um, budgeting, you know, if you're not an accountant, I know it's a little, you know, if you're not really into numbers, it's a little daunting. I'm not gonna lie, it can be a little scary, but the good news is, is that anybody can do it. Um, it's as simple as figuring out what kind of expenses are you gonna have? What kind of income do you expect? Um, honestly, I think the hardest thing to figure out is what kind of income to expect because it's not like we can look over on the, on the stock exchange and find out how much tomatoes are going for these days um, at the local market. Um, so as far as, as, as figuring out a budget, honestly, my number one suggestion to everybody is find yourself another local farmer who does something similar to what you do um, and ask them, you know, hey, you still sell stuff at the farmer's market, you know, what kind of income and expenses do you have with your garden? What kind of income and expenses do you have with your animals? You know, what are some of the things that you're seeing uh, popping up that I'm not thinking of? Or even find a mentor that say, hey, here's my rough budget. What do you think? What am I missing? Am I being realistic? Am I not? Um, honestly, it comes down to connections. Um, to be, You don't have to be a, a math whiz. You don't have to be an accountant to come up with budgets. Anyone can do it. So I wonder if you maybe sort of answer this question, but I'm gonna ask it because it's just a little bit different than what you were just were speaking to. So the question is, do you have a suggestion on how to adjust the numbers provided by an ag extension on farm budgets to best fit the size of your operation or resources that would better explain these numbers? Okay, if I, I think I get you. <laughs> so, um, the extension offices are great resources, but like you said too, everybody's operation's a little different. Um, you know, when you, you've got somebody who's just got a little spot in their backyard and maybe the numbers you're getting there are like, you know, acres of corn. Um, you know, it, I think it goes back to, I mean, the best, the best way to do it is to find somebody a little bit closer to, you know, what you already create. And believe it or not, there are people out there, I mean, look around you, look at everybody on the screen right now. I mean, there's a lot of wonderful resources that we have here. Um, and then extension offices also provide, uh, or they also have an idea of who in the area um, does what. And so they're another good resource for that too. Um, otherwise I'm gonna throw you at Stephanie too and be like, hey, Stephanie can hook you up. <laughs> but yeah, as far as doing that calculation and on and, and bringing it down, um, it is, it's kind of tricky. It's really honestly kind of tricky, um, especially um, when you're dealing with, like, I look at my animals, um, because there is an actual market out there um, for animal, how, for the various different animals that I do. However, I'm going to flat out tell you guys, I don't sell my hogs at market. I don't take them to auction house or anything. I sell them directly to customer. My price is not typically affected by market price. So I look at what happened this spring uh, when COVID hit and everything just kind of plummeted, numbers started plummeting. Um, we had people contacting us thinking we're going to give away our pigs. Um, and my response is no, because I have a completely different market. Um, and I think a lot of that is knowing your market, um, understanding your market, um, and knowing people in your market. Thank you. So here's the next, the next question. What kind of synergies are you expecting by adding so many different livestock components? For this type of expansion of livestock, are you reinvesting your own profits, borrowing? And then here's the caveat. 
if it's too personal, don't answer. <laughs> um, you know, when it comes to my farm, um, I, I, I'm also a person, nothing's too personal for me. I'll tell you whatever you want to know. Um, but you know, when it comes to the farm, so, okay. So the first part of the question was, um, what again, <laughs> sorry. Absolutely. I'm going to go back here. Okay. So what kind of synergies are you expecting by adding so many different livestock components? So type of synergies. So kind of the working together aspect of it or, okay. How they kind of complement so. each other. Yeah. So the big thing, um, having such a variety of different animals um, on our farm and in small quantities too, again, I, I want to keep it small, um, is I have something that appeals to just about anyone. Um, you know, you've got vegetarians, that's all right, I got veggies, but as far as like, you know, even the animal side of things, um, you know, I, I have a lot of customers who uh, strictly don't uh, eat pork, for example, that's fine. I've got chickens, I've got lamb, that's not a problem. Um, I've got some people who have allergies, you know, so on the market side of things, I've got that good variety. On the actual farm itself, um, it's actually kind of interesting to see how my animals interact with each other. Um, it's not uncommon for my pigs and my lambs, uh, they share a fence, um, to actually kind of chill with each other on each side of the fence a little bit. They kind of, they feel comfortable with each other. They're kind of one instead of being freaked out with each other. Um, my chickens, I have free ranging chickens and they are, they're always in the lamb pen because they're looking for the scraps, um, everything that the lambs drop. Um, they're digging through some of the droppings, you know, trying to find the little pieces that aren't digested as much or, you know, kind of eating through that. So um, we've got a lot of, uh, I guess you can call it synergy that's going on there. Um, now, the second part of that question was... Yeah, so um, for this type of expansion of livestock, are you reinvesting your own profits borrow or borrowing? Or both, um, actually, I, I have been in a very... Um, I've had a very good situation the last few years. Um, our family by no means has an excess of funds. Um, I will tell you that we didn't start with an excess of funds. Um, when we sold our house and moved out to the farm, we were able to um, purchase it and, and be um, mortgage free, which has helped us drastically. But I also quit my nice, really big figure job um, in my corporate world. And so income was drastically dropped there. Um, what I've been able to do is piggyback off of my husband just a little bit the first year to get started. Um, I, I guess you could say I borrowed from him, which he borrowed from his operating loan <laughs> um, the very first year. And I've been very fortunate that since then I've been able to take the money that um, I've been able to raise starting that first year and actually put it right back into my operation. Um, thankfully, our family is in a position where our family doesn't rely on my income as much quite yet. Um, I will say I do have a couple little side accounting jobs that do help um, family wise, but they're, I mean, super part time, you know, one of them's one day a week. Uh, the other two that I've got, um, if it's one day, it's maybe like four hours a week. So it's very, very part time. Um, but thankfully, I've been able to actually put it right back into the farm, which I do recommend if anyone is able to do that, if you're able to take that step, um, I highly recommend taking that money, putting it right back into your operation. Don't expect a paycheck right off the bat. Um, you know, even I even give my husband crap for that. I'm like, you know, some days or some years we're just going to not have a paycheck, you know, depending on what markets are. Um, but that would be one of my biggest my biggest pieces of advice is don't don't expect a paycheck right away. Don't think you're going to take you know this big, huge lump sum. You want to be able to invest that back into your farm and make sure it's successful. So someday it can provide that paycheck. Great. Okay. Here the questions are coming coming fast now. So okay. <laughs> how do you explain to IRS that you can't make income until your trees slash bushes grow enough to be productive? It's going to operate at a loss for a few years. <laughs> that is why I am not a tax accountant. <laughs> and I will not touch taxes. <laughs> Get yourself a really good tax accountant who can, can fudge those numbers around for you. Um, typically when you're looking at something like that, um, like I said, I, I'm not a tax accountant by any means. I understand it just enough to be dangerous. Um, but uh, there are ways when you do your income taxes, depending on if you have any other secondary incomes, you know, in, in your main income, secondary incomes, anything else, um, you're able to, like, very first year, it's not uncommon to have a lost year. And basically, 
Um, I look at my husband's farm, for example, um, the first few years we've had losses each year, um, but basically it's a zero at the end of the year. You're just like, I didn't make any income. And a lot of those expenses um, do actually get carried forward to future years so that when you do start making some money, you can actually carry forward those expenses and help start offsetting some of the income that you have down, down the road. Now, I will say the IRS is going to start getting a little leery once you hit that five-year mark and you've yet to make a penny and you keep claiming that zero, I'm, I can guarantee you're going to start showing up on the red flags. Um, but at least those first two, three years um, before things get established, um, there's ways around it. You just need a really good tax accountant. Thank you. So next question, what have been the most effective way to find and develop your direct to consumer market? That has been a tricky one. And I'm not going to lie. I have fourth year into this, three years into this. I'm, I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, um, some of the ways, honestly, social media has been great. Um, but using it correctly is where things get a little tricky. Um, social media can be a wonderful thing if you know how to use it. Um, the other thing is, is I, I've been very blessed um, that I'm about 25 miles south of Fargo and Fargo has a phenomenal network of, um, of uh, farmers markets. Um, I'm also halfway between Fargo and Wapaton. Wapaton has a farmers market. And so I actually have two uh, marketing areas that I can work off of. Although I will say Fargo is probably my biggest one. Um, I wish I had more uh, input or more feedback for those who maybe live in the more um, sparse parts of North Dakota or Minnesota, <laughs> where you're not as close to those bigger cities. Um, those areas, I, I have no idea. I'm sorry, I, I have no clue where to direct people there. Um, unless I know there's a few that make it work. Um, you know, if you're willing to deliver things like that. But as far as finding markets, um, the other thing is uh, uh, joining different uh, groups. So there's a number of different groups that I'm involved in, like on Facebook, for example, right now, especially um, ones that have some really good resources. Um, there is, I, I love being part of some of the food groups up in the Fargo area. Uh, there's a number of different resources there that um, all of a sudden somebody like, hey, I'm looking for somebody who's got lamb. I'm like, hey, got it right here. What can I do for you? Um, there's also, I believe it's a North Dakota Farm to Table Facebook group. Um, if, you know, even if you're not in North Dakota, still check it out. Um, even if you're, you know, if you're close enough to the border. Um, but I believe it's a, a North Dakota Farm to Table group has been a really good resource for me also. Um, just kind of, and then honestly, peers, finding people and asking them, where would you like to see me? Where would you find me? You know, if you were looking for this, where would you look? Um, and going from there. Thank you. So how has farming affected your quality of life and um, changed your lifestyle, good, bad, or otherwise? Okay, so I'm not gonna lie, guys, this is one that I actually get a little choked up on. <laughs> so farming to me, honestly, has meant the world. Um, I used to work at a big corporate job. I was working anywhere from 40, 50, 55 hours a week um, in a managerial position at a very large corporation. and. Um, although I, when I left after nine and a half years, I was the most senior employee, um, within the company, which was great, but it still didn't make up for the fact that I missed out on my kids' basketball games, that I was constantly missing out on their activities. I wasn't there when they got home from school. Um, I've, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, I've got four kids. <laughs> I've got a 15 year old, a 13 year old and twin nine year olds. So over the years, these past few years have been really awesome because I have been able to make my own schedule. I have been able to be there when my kids have basketball games that I have to drive two hours to go see at four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, or if my kids have a Veterans Day program going on at the school, I can take off in the middle of the day. I can head over there and I can actually watch it and encourage them in that. Um, I, there's times I volunteer at my kids' school. So you know, being there for my kids has been a huge, huge, huge blessing. Um, and for me personally, it is worth every penny that I gave up at my corporate job um, to not only do what I love, but to also be there for my family. 
Um, not to mention my husband, because of that, I can actually help him out on the farm too. Be there during harvest. I can take lunches out to him when he wants it. So for me that you talk that work-life balance, um, for me, it's been a huge, huge step coming from the corporate world, coming into being on the farm full time. You know, every penny I gave up is definitely worth it. Um, now, as far as the farm, I, I'm an early, I'm an early morning person. It, it's not uncommon to get up at four or 5 a.m. Um, and I'll sit at my computer and I'll catch up on emails and I'll tinker on with this paperwork and that paperwork because then by 6, 630, the house is starting to move. So I can actually get a couple hours in in the morning before I got to get everybody off to school. And then I get a lot done during the day when the husband and the kids are gone. Um, it's been absolutely wonderful. So thank you for showing us you're the real you. <laughs> um, so what kind of inputs do I need to make good financial decisions for my family and my farm dream? What kind of inputs? Is this a question? This is one of the, the pre- One of your questions? Yeah. Okay. I was gonna say if it was somebody else's question to ask for a little bit more clarification. So when you say inputs, um, expand on that just a little bit. So I'm thinking, so what, what, what are the metrics or what are the, what are the pieces that, you know, that are, that are helpful to you to, to have the knowledge of, to then be able to make financial decisions? Like, are there, do you, are there go to, you know, do you create your own dashboard or like, what, what is that? What are, what are those, what is that? What are those pieces? Gotcha. Okay. So, um, because I'm an accountant and I'm a bit of a nerd, um, I am a huge QuickBooks buff. Like I, I love my QuickBooks. Um, and I also love Excel. So, um, and I know how to work some crazy stuff in Excel people. <laughs> um, so honestly, is as far as the inputs, just on the financial aspect, um, usually I'm, I'm looking at where I'm at, um, is a big one. I highly recommend keeping your books updated. Um, I'm not going to lie. It's a huge struggle for me in those summer months. I can go easily a few months without getting my books updated um, and all my receipts and stuff entered know exactly where I'm at in those, in those really hard months. But keeping your book, your, your books, your records and everything updated, knowing exactly where you're at financially. Um, the other function that I really uh, have found very helpful in QuickBooks since I am a very, very diverse farm, um, I need to know exactly where I'm at with my lamb specifically where my, ch my meat chicken specifically, you know, it's, um, for me, it's not just one bucket, you know, I don't go to the farmer's market and sell, you know, all these different kinds of things, throw it all in bucket and say, yep, I made X dollar amount. I have it actually, and I keep records of my breakdown. Every market I go to, I figure out exactly how much lamb I sold, how much pork I sold, how much chicken I sold, how many veggies I sold, how much, I forgot to mention, I do jams and jellies. <laughs> Um, and pickles and stuff with all my produce out of the garden. I, I, I do all the canning stuff that brings me into the winter months. Um, I need to know exactly how much I sold of each of those so that then I can compare, okay, what are my inputs? What money am I putting into these? What am I selling them for? Am I making any money? Um, this year, uh, we did a trial. Um, I'm trying to remember who it was that said pork. One of my lovely peoples was talking pork. That Brent, there you are. Um, and I was like, you said that. And I'm like, oh, I would have had an awesome deal for you. Just a few weeks ago, I got rid of my absolute favorite breeding sow and my favorite breeding boar. Frank and Petunia were their names. Um, I, I was going to give them to one of the local neighbors because I just wanted them to go to a good home. Um, we figured out that for us in our situation, breeding our own pigs was not working. It was not profitable enough. In fact, we were losing money on it. Um, just with our situation, not saying that you can't, Brent, it's totally feasible. Just the situation that we're in, um, it just wasn't, it wasn't feasible. So being able to know exactly where you stand on each piece. Now, I'm not saying figure out how much you sell in carrots versus tomatoes versus, you know, but if you want to go that deep, you certainly can. Um, but being able to dig down deep, dig on, down into the details and really put together um, where you're at exactly with the different pieces of your farm if you do diversify. Sorry, that's a long answer. I could sit here and talk all night, guys. <laughs> well, I, we're gonna have one more question um, okay. for you, and then um, then we'll have to then we'll have to move on because our time we're down to minutes now. So, 
The final question is, any suggestions for someone wanting to work full time and farm? Bless your heart. <laughs> Bless your heart, but you know what, it can be done. Um, it's not something, as I told you before, it's not something that I chose to do um, just because of family reasons. And, and that was just, that's not the choice I wanted to make, but it is perfectly feasible to do. Um, if you were to go that route, my high, my number one recommendation is have like three backup plans for everything. Um, because you know, something's going to go wrong. All of a sudden you're going to have to be at the office late or something's going to happen. And you got to get home because your animals need to be get fed or your garden needs to be watered, have backup plans in place. Um, and then also um, manage your time. Time management's huge. I mean, I don't care whether you're working full time or not. Time management on a farm is huge because it is very easy to get sucked into this and that and this and that. And all of a sudden, oh my gosh, it's the end of May and I haven't planted anything in my garden yet because I was doing X, Y, and Z. Um, those would be some big things. Um, but like I said, I mean, bless your heart, working full time and farming, that's that's a huge undertaking. Um, and make sure you have a really good support system in place. Um, whether it's your direct family, you've got close friends, close neighbors, find a good support system. Well, I think I can speak for everyone um, in saying thank you, Jen, um, really, um, for for being so open and honest and, and willing to, to share your experiences and your insight. Um, yeah, we all, we all greatly appreciate that. So thank you. Yeah, we're getting thumbs up people. Yes. Good You're deal. very welcome. And I, I love it. You guys are awesome. And I wish the best to all of you because listening to some of your stories and your dreams and stuff, we've got some really kick-ass farmers up in here. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. So the next, um, the next piece, which we're going to get to really um, is kind of our final piece before we, we close for the evening. Um, so this is our last activity. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to share my screen because Stephanie has so kindly said um, that she will, um, she will take notes for us. So here I can't talk and share my screen at the same time. I don't know about you all people, but I can't do it. Okay, I think. So hopefully you can see um, a Google document that says session one key takeaways. I'm seeing nodding heads. Okay, good. So Stephanie's going to um, take notes for us and I'd love to hear um, from just whomever. Um, you can take a turn or not if you don't want to, um, but I want to find out what have you noticed or learned in the last hour and a half? And anybody can go because I can't see you all now that I'm all sharing my screen and all these things. So just unmute yourself and tell us what have you noticed or learned? I'm going to have to jump off quick here. So um, I'll go first. Um, it was mentioned earlier that the collective um, thoughts of everybody coming together and, and talking about your dreams was really valuable. And even from the perspective of somebody who's worked in the local foods uh, arena for 13 years, Jen, I didn't know that you were that diverse. I didn't know there was an orchard in Bisbee. I didn't know, you know, I didn't know that we had all of these things going on. And, and I thought I knew the majority of farmers out there. You know, so I, I think collective activities like this um, are so valuable. Thanks, Holly. Things you've noticed or learned. Hi, this is Michael. Um, I would say what I learned was the community connection, but but even taking it farther than I had thought about it. So I was thinking more like a farmer's market. And then I heard how, um, you know, Jen was also celebrating, for example, the history and, um, and things I could do like gardening as therapy and stuff. So again, I think this goes back to the collective thoughts, but just how 
how many at how through so many levels we can be connected to the community through agriculture and and that was really inspiring thanks michael Well, maybe I'll jump in if possible. Yes, please, uh, Michelle. I was going to say what I have found is people are more interested in the quality of life than it than the money. I, most people don't get into farming thinking they're going to become millionaires. I think what it is is they're looking for uh, more. It's more altruistic, if you will. You still have to be able to feed yourself and uh, fend for yourself. But I think what people really are looking for is is a better life and more connected to the land and to community. And uh, it's a much more satisfying life. Thanks, Michelle. Things you've noticed or learned. Go ahead, Paul. I think just listening to what different people are saying the unlike say in in conventional farming where we have a lot of answers for the questions that were raised tonight there's a, kind of like cookbooks out there if you want to call them that that already been developed lots of information budgets and markets and all that kind of stuff that are available and and yet i heard even jen who's been at it a few years and holly who's been at it longer and morgan as we were talking there's in, in this local food business, a lot of unknowns. It's still finding its way through a lot of these pieces. And, and it probably always will because everybody's gonna have such a, a diverse operation, but there's, there's definitely an opportunity to be continuing to gather information and, and pulling that together to help uh, people who are in the local food business um, either entering or even just as they're going along to, uh, to uh, build their businesses better and stronger. Thanks, Paul. Can I say something? Yes, please, David. Uh, one of the things I'm seeing is that everything is going back to the way it was when I was a kid. People are trying to grow their own stuff rather than going and getting it off a shelf, uh, that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you, David. Go ahead, Mark. I would say uh, one of the things I've learned, and maybe I knew this beforehand, but I just reiterated that it's uh, Farming is a never ending journey of learning. There's so much to know about so many things. And I feel like um, that's one of the appeals for me too. It's just like, I could constantly learn uh, until I die and I still won't have enough uh, grasp about everything that uh, you can get into inside the world of agriculture. So I like that a lot. Thanks, Mark. Okay, thank you for sharing. Um, so as we um, as we wrap up tonight, um, I want to again thank you all um, for your willingness to share, um, and I'm super excited about your dreams. Um, it is I am I'm humbled and fortunate um, to have been a part of this and been able to hear that. So thank you for that. Um, we know that sharing our dreams with others makes it a little more real. Um, and so being able to write it down, um, being able to say it out loud um, can help, yeah, can help make, make it actually happen because it becomes more real. Um, thanks again to Jen for sharing her story. Um, we appreciate you a lot. Um, next week, we're going to be back here um, at, from six to eight, um, just like we are here now. Um, and I believe you used the same link that you used this time. Um, and so we'll be, we'll, we'll all be old friends by that point, right? Um, so we'll all be back here. Um, so we're going to connect with each other again. Um, we're gonna hear from some more farmers 
We're also going to hear about um, another program that Farms does, which is called Farms Beginnings. Um, so Stephanie is going to tell us a little more about that, um, which you're kind of getting a peek of it right now, quite honestly. Um, is this, and when Jen's giving a thumbs up for that deal. Um, so this is, you know, this is just a little taste of the, of what you do in Farm Beginnings. Um, you just go in farther in depth, right, and spend more time um, on each of the, kind of these topics. So we're going to learn more about that, as well as other resources that um, farms themselves have and or that they know about in our region. So that's what we're kind of going to do next time. Um, I do encourage you, if you haven't already done the pre-work um, that was sent out, so there was a video um, and there were two exercises. So one was documenting your farm dream, um, being that B of, um, yeah, I could stop sharing, couldn't I? So sorry. I'm going to stop sharing so we can just talk. There we go. How's that? Um, so um, documenting your farm dream, whether that be in words or in pictures or I don't know, however else you want to do it, um, figuring out how, yeah, figuring out what your dream is. Um, so doing that and then taking the ready, the ready assessment, the readiness assessment. So even if you haven't done that already, I encourage you to do that between now and next Tuesday, um, because that just enhances um, your time spent on your dream, um, which is that's kind of what this what this is all about, right, is taking time to spend on your dream. Um, and so being able to do that. And if you've already done, you've already worked on your dream and documenting it, maybe go back this week and look at it again um, and see are there other things that you can add or are you now going to be a little more focused in this area? Um, and so spending time you know, with yourself, um, thinking about that farm dream. So that is all I have for today. Stephanie, do you have anything else that you want to add before we say good night? Um, one is that if anybody just can't wait until next week to know about Farm Beginnings. I do have the Farm Beginnings website up. Uh, it's, it's in draft form. There'll be more added to it, but if you are just raring to go, you can register for Farm Beginnings now. I do have the registration form open and that's at farms.org slash succeed. Um, and everyone who registered for Farm Dreams will get an email from me tomorrow with the recording from tonight's session um do you want me to send them the, the harvest um yeah we could do that as well and you'll get the harvest as well and any other information that's pertinent for next week so look for that email from me tomorrow sounds good so thank you everyone have a lovely evening um and i look forward to seeing your beautiful faces next tuesday night <laughs>